Hallelujah. Your presence is heaven to me. Thank you, Alice. The Lord wanted me to go ahead and get into the message, and we will take up the offering at the end. I leaned over and told Sister Lefebvre what the Lord's plan was, and she was just so gracious. She says, Barry, if you call me up, I go up. If you don't, I don't. <laughs> so thank you, sweetie. Um, before I begin, I want to... Sister Wanda sent a note to, thanking all of us for our, for our help and participation in the uh, birthday celebration for Brother Don. So I just wanted to let you all know that, that she was really appreciative and grateful. And it was a nice time. It really was. It was, it was wonderful. Go ahead, Sister Cindy. Uh -huh. The title of the message this morning is Understanding the Real Battle. Understanding the Real Battle. And we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 17. The Lord has really been ministering to me about some of the things in 1 Samuel, particularly chapter 12 and 16 and 17. But there's also some things in chapter 8 that has really started to come forward and work in my mind. And I know at some point we'll talk about some of those things too, but that's not for today. When you look at 1 Samuel chapter 17, it's the story of David and Goliath. Really, it's, the, it's not about David and Goliath. It's really about how the enemy of the soul attacks the body of Christ. Okay? It's really about how the enemy of the soul attacks the body of Christ. And so... We're going to look at that record this morning, and I'm going to tell you the record has 54 verses, 58 verses. We're going to read 50 of them, okay? But we're going to really get into it because there are some things I think the Lord wants to point out and wants us to see. When you get to 1 Samuel chapter 17, two things have already happened. Number one, Saul has disobeyed himself out of a kingdom. Okay, he disobeyed himself out of a kingdom. And, and notice the words that I used. God didn't take the kingdom away from Saul. Saul threw it away by how he responded to God's will for his life and for the kingdom. The second thing that's happened before we get to 1 Samuel chapter 17 is David has been anointed king. David has been anointed king. Now, even though David has been anointed king, it's going to be another 10, 12 years before he walks into the throne. Okay, because Saul reigns for 40 years. And this is almost just a little past the midway point of Saul's reign. And when I think about that, I'm thinking, he knows for the next 10, 15 years that after I'm done, none of my sons are going to sit on the throne because of what I did. Because of what I did. Let that sink in, ladies and gentlemen. If you think that the decisions you make only affect you, think again. Think again. I'm reminded of the story of the passage in the New Testament about how when the storm came and then the ship started to sink, the message there is when your ship starts to sink, when you start to sink, those who follow you are going to sink too. Those who follow you are going to sink too. All right? So we get to 1 Samuel chapter 17. And it's a heartbreaking chapter. It really is. Because you're going to see a group of people who have lost heart. You're going to see a group of people who no longer understand who they are as far as their covenant relationship with the Lord. 
And it just breaks your heart. Because when you look at the covenant relationship they have with God and they're not living it, and then you think about the body of Christ who are sons and daughters and not living it, it just really breaks your heart. Verse 1 of chapter 17. And I'm going to be up front with you. I'm going to mispronounce some words. Okay? <laughs> it's going to happen. Okay? <laughs> That's just the way it is. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shachuk, which belongs to Judah, and pitched between Shachuk and Ezekah and the Eph... That one. <laughs> and Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. When it says set the battle in array, it means they were getting ready to go to battle. They were preparing to battle. Verse 3. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side. Philistines stood on this side of the mountain. The Israelites stood on this side of the mountain. And between the two mountains, there was a valley. Okay, there was a valley. I want you to listen to this. The valley is the place where the fight takes place. The valley is the place where the fight takes place. It is the lowest point. Think about where your battles occur. Typically when you're at your lowest point emotionally. Okay? A soldier fighting in the valley knew he may never leave it. The enemy of the soul wants to get you in your valley, ladies and gentlemen. And he wants to keep you in your valley to the point you don't come out. That you are no longer fighting for the God that you serve. No Israelite wanted to go into the valley. And you can see that by their reaction to Goliath's taunting, and we're going to see this in a few minutes. And let me tell you what the Lord brought to mind. Remember Psalm 23, verse 4? Yea, through our walk, through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I wonder if God brought that back to David's mind as he was writing this psalm. I can walk through that valley but I am not going to fear any evil because I'm going to come out of the valley. Okay? Look at verse 4. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a, and a span, and he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. Goliath looked at the Israelites and said, I'm about to go postal. <laughs> I'm just telling you, I am about to go postal. <laughs> he had a coat of mail. <laughs> Can you say that again a little louder, please? <laughs> He had a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass, and he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his, the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. Okay? Now, you got some blanks for a reason, because I want you to have this. Six cubits, one cubit is about 18 inches, give or take. One span is about nine inches, give or take. So Goliath was between nine feet, nine inches tall, and 11 feet and three inches tall, depending on how you do the numbers. But a minimum, you're looking at a man who's almost 10 feet tall, okay? Now I'm six, two and a half, so add another three and a half feet to Barry, 
Okay. And see, Goliath was a warrior. So Goliath was a little more firmer than Barry. Okay. Goliath was a warrior, so he was solidly built. He probably weighed anywhere between 450 to 600 pounds of muscle, ready to do battle. Okay. Now, Barry, well, let me finish before I say this. Um, the coat of mail is sort of like a metal shirt, and it weighs six, 5,000 shekels of brass. That's about 157 pounds. Who in here weighs about 150 pounds, give or take? Okay, Alex, can you, can you imagine walking around with Alex hanging on you and it not bother you? I mean, I can't. I can't. A target is a javelin in verse 6. And the greaves of brass, they covered the thighs and legs down to the heel. And then in verse 7, it says that uh, his spear's head weighed 600 shackles. That's about 19 pounds. Okay? Now, why did I want to go into such detail about what Goliath was wearing? The enemy wants you to focus on what you see. If you see someone who is nine feet, nine inches tall, wearing Alex, <laughs> and having a, 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 a spear whose head weighs 19 pounds, how many of you have, you know, you do your weight exercise with these little 10, down, 10 pound uh, bar? Barbells, 10 pounds. You know how heavy those get after a while. Can you imagine just carrying around a spear whose head weighs 19 pounds? The enemy of the soul wants you to get so focused on what you see that you forget about who you are. And that's always going to be the battle. He wants you to see what you're facing rather than who's got your back. And see, as a body of Christ, we've gotten to the point that we have forgotten that because we've compromised all along the way with different things in this country. Same-sex marriage, we've compromised on that. I want to make sure it's still there. One of the things that's going on in this country right now that you hadn't heard a whole bunch about is this whole issue about transgender. There are now cities... In a couple of states that are mandated that every bathroom be a neutral bathroom. So if Judy is using the bathroom or she's going into what used to be the ladies' room, Barry can now go right behind her. Can you see how messed up that is? And think about the places uh, like L.A. Fitness, for example. None of, the, none of the, the spaces are now off limits to both male and females. When I think about that, ladies and gentlemen, it just really angers me because we have the ability to stop all of that, we being the body of Christ. But because we have such a lackadaisical attitude about things, we have allowed things to happen in this world that should not have happened. That should not have happened. Michelle, three gorgeous daughters, okay? Can you imagine them going into their bathroom at their school and then some eighth grader, ninth grader comes walking in, guy right behind them? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? And yet we are seeing that because the body of Christ has just put up his arm, put up his hand and say, okay, well, whatever you want to do, world, we're not going to stop you. We want to stop you after it's too late. Because, see, we want to get angry. We want to re we react instead of being proactive. That's what the body of Christ does. We react instead of being proactive. And that's why we're seeing a lot of the things that we're seeing. 
And if you listen long enough to the media and what people say, you, you get to the point that you, that you think that it's going to happen no matter what I do. That's why we are losing the battle. Because we've already given up. We've already said it's going to happen regardless of what we do. Okay? There's a young man in this story that says, it don't have to be that way. Okay? In verses 5 through 7, in the natural, what you could see and hear, Goliath was unbeatable. In the natural. He had prepared himself to do battle in the natural his whole life. Now listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. He was oblivious to the spiritual nature of this battle. He was oblivious to the spiritual nature of this battle. Many of us in the body of Christ are oblivious to the spiritual nature of the battles we're in. David wasn't. We're going to see that. Look in verse 8. And he, Goliath, stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine? And ye servants to Saul, choose you a man for you and let him come down. Remember, we looked at a word in verse four that said the word champion. Champion means a go between. So Goliath was saying, OK, I'm the champion for for the Philistines. You need to find yourself a champion and we will fight. Not the whole armies, but just the two of us will fight. You know, that's not a bad idea. That's not a bad idea. I like to go, OK. Islam. Get, you get one person, and then we get one person. And whoever wins, wins. We lose. You know why? Because we're not nearly as dedicated to our cause as they are. Spanking, spanking, spanking. But on, on, on the surface, it's a good idea to do that. Notice that Goliath said the servants of Saul, the servants of Saul. Israel was supposed to be the servants of God. They became the servants of Saul back in chapter eight when they said, we want a king to rule us like the other nations. OK. OK. You know, the Lord just, he just dropped so many things in me about this, this passage. I want you to listen to what he said. They wanted to be led by sight and not by faith. They want to be led by sight and not by faith. And are we not seeing this today in the body of Christ? God has been rejected in favor of man. And the body of Christ has become to leader, has, have become servants to leaders they do not know. That, no, leaders that do not know God. That's where we are. Welcome to America. Stephen would tell you, many times when he, he and I are having conversations that are somewhat difficult, my way of responding to diff, difficulties, and Sean and I talked about this a little bit too, Humor. That's, it's humor because you've got to have it so people understand that it's, it's bad, but it's not so bad that it cannot be undone. Okay? When Israel said that we wanted a king to be like the other nations back in chapter 8, I want you to understand what they're saying. Because when you read in chapter 12, Samuel reminds them that God was their king and they rejected their king. So what they're telling Samuel, what they're telling God is instead of having you as our king, we want a king just like all the other, other nations, a king who does not know God. 
That's what they were telling them. We want a king that does not know God. Because we want to be like all the other nations. Chapter 12 is not the focus of this message. But when, we, when, when Israel said we want a king like the other nations they, and they rejected God, okay, imagine the body of Christ saying, we want, we are going to reject you, God, and we want to be ruled by a nation that doesn't know you. We want to be ruled by the Muslims. That's what they were saying. When you say that today, you just might as well just put, we want to be mo- ruled by the Muslims because they don't know God. That is what Israel did. We want to be ruled by someone who doesn't know God. And see, all the nations that they wanted to be, that they wanted to be like didn't like them. They didn't like them, and yet they wanted to be like them. Do you think the Muslims love Christians? No, but based on this example, many in the body will say we want we want to be like the Muslims because we don't want you ruling us, God. Verse eleven. Well, now let me see. Back up. Verse nine. If he be able to fight me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if ye prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants. And serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel. Remember that. I defy the armies of Israel. This day, give me a man that I may fight against him. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they got so mad, they say, come on, let's do this now. (laughs) They said, we're tired of you saying things about our God. Come on, shut up, Goliath. Put your dukes up and let's get this done. No. They were in dismay. They were in fear. Remember chapter 15 where God told Saul that the kingdom was going to be ripped away from him and God's anointing also left? Saul no longer carried God's blessing and anointing. If you were a soldier and you saw your king eaten up with fear, how would you react? Would you feel as though you had already lost the battle? And they did. Fear cannot be forced upon a person. Let that sink in. Fear cannot be forced upon a person. Fear is something that you have to take. It's an eternal response to a threat. It's a self-preservation mechanism. The person with a sin nature has no defense against fear that rises up from within. The sons and daughters of God do. You have in your notes Philippians chapter 4 verse 6. Let's look at Proverbs 16.3. Hold your fingers in 1 Samuel. In Proverbs 16.3. It says, commit thy works unto the Lord. And what will be established? Your thoughts. So if your thoughts are established in the Lord, there's not going to be a possibility for fear, ladies and gentlemen. Let that sink in. But see, if you want to be ruled by leaders who don't know God, that's going to be another story altogether. Look at verse 12. Now, David was the son of the Ephraimite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse. He had eight sons, and the man was among men, an old man in the days of Saul. In other words, Jesse was an old man when Saul was was reigning. And the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to battle. The names of the three sons that went in the battle were Elab, the firstborn, the next was Abinadab, and the third was Shema. And David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. 40 days of humiliation. 40 days. 
And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of parched corn and these ten loaves, and run to the camp to thy brethren, and carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand, and look how thy brethren fare, and take their pledge. What Jesse was saying, I want you to go to the, to the battle lines, and I want you to find your brothers, and I want, you, I want you to get something from them that you can bring home to let me know that they're okay. That's what their pledge is talking about. So that I will know that they're okay. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting the Philistines. They were not literally fighting again. They were getting ready to fight. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to fight and shouted for battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array army against army. They were lining up. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage, ran into the army, and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the army of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, the same words that he spoke in verse 9. Now listen, look at the next four words. And David heard them. David heard them. Now, when I read that, let me tell you where my mind went. Go to Numbers chapter 12. In Numbers chapter 12, look at verse 2. Well, Look at verse 1. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Hath he not spoken but also by us? And the Lord heard it. You know what happened after the Lord heard it. Okay? It was not a pretty sight for Miriam. Okay, she got leprosy, and then Aaron was so afraid that he was going to get it, he started begging Moses to intercede for them. It was not a pretty sight. My point being, when God in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14, said he sought a man after mine own heart, you're looking at it right here, David. A man after his own heart. What made God angry made David angry. Okay? And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, they fled from him and were so afraid. Again, they saw Goliath. And had already decided, we cannot defeat Goliath. Verse 25. And the men of Israel said, have you? Ye seen this man that has come up, surely to defy Israel, he has come up, and it shall be the man who killeth him. The king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. He he won't have to pay any taxes. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine? Because he had not heard what they just said. And take away the reproach from Israel. Take away the reproach from Israel. Take away the embarrassment of inactivity, the embarrassment of cowering down, the embarrassment of not speaking up, the embarrassment of not acting like who they were. Ladies and gentlemen, who is going to take away the reproach of the body of Christ? Because the thing that I have just described is what is going on in the body of Christ right now. And take away the reproach from Israel. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Uncircumcised Philistine. Read in your mind when you read that covenant. He has no covenant with God. Now, and he should defy the armies of who? The living God. In verse, 
Where was it? In verse, I'm looking for, yeah, in verse 8, Goliath stood and cried unto the armies of Israel. Do you see this? The armies of Israel. David says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine who dares to defy the armies of the living God? Did David not understand the spiritual nature of this battle? Yes, he did. Each one of us can stand in the face of adversity, in the face of everything the enemy of the soul wants to throw, and says, who can defy the sons and daughters of the living God? Who? If you read Romans chapter 8, it says no one. No one. Because we are more than conquerors. Not because of who we are, because of who we have become. We are more than conquerors. David knew this. David says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine who has the unmitigated gall to stand up and defy the armies of Gaul, of God, the living God? And I can just see the soldiers of Israel uh, looking around like, oh, I don't know. Jesus never said being a Christian is going to be an easy walk. Jesus said that if they hate me, they're going to hate you. So get it in your minds right now, ladies and gentlemen. When you are a Christian, you have a target on your back. You have a target on your back. Get used to it. Because, see, they're going to come after you until you become part of the reproach. Once you become part of the reproach, the ones who's not fighting back, they're going to leave you alone. You start fighting back, they're going to come after you again. The enemy of the soul never quits. Take away the approach of Israel. Verse 27. And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. So they repeated verse 25. Verse 28. And Elop, his eldest Brother heard when he spake unto the men, and Elip's anger was kindled against David. I wonder, was it because David had been appointed king back in chapter 16, and he wasn't being the eldest? And he said, Why comest thou, comest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left these few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou might see the battle and see us be embarrassed. That's what he's saying. <laughs> And David said, what have I done now? Did I not have a cause? Did not my father send me down here? And he turned from him towards another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner of what would happen if he defeats Goliath. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, David the shepherd who just come out of the field, who is only there because his father told him to go, is talking to the king of Israel. Let no man's heart fail because of him, including yours. Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight the Philistine. Thy servant will go and fight the Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able. What? I just told you not to fear. I just told you I'm going to beat him. And you're going to tell me I'm not able? Whenever you take a stand for the Lord, there are going to be folks in the body of Christ who are going to say it's not happening. When you pray for someone, they're going to say, I don't believe it's going to happen. When you take a stand for this or take a stand for that, you're going to have brothers and sisters who are not going to stand with you. King Saul 
is speaking unbelief based on what he sees before him. There is Goliath. There is David. He responds to what he sees. He's thinking, there's just no way that this is going to happen. This kid is going to go out there and he's going to be slaughtered. David's response in verse 34 and 35 flows from the heart that knows God is his permanent, his covenant father. His response flows from the heart that God is his, per, his covenant father. Our response, ladies and gentlemen, must flow from the fact that we know that God is our father, which is better than having a covenant. 33 again. And Saul said to David, thou art not able to go out against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth. You're still wet behind the ears. And took, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said in verse 34, thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion. He comes as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And a bear. And this uncircumcised. Notice how many times David is saying this. King, do you not understand? He is uncircumcised. He does not have a covenant. Do you not see this? And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. David was honked off. He was honked off. And can you imagine? I'm sure David was not standing before Saul and says, let no man be afraid. I'll go out and fight the Philistine. I mean, besides, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he thinks he can uh, defy the arms of the living God? I'm sure that was not how David said that. <laughs> I, am abs- I am positively sh- convinced that's not how he said that. He was talking to the king. He was angry. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine who thinks he can defy the armies of the living God? And he's looking the king right in the eyes. And the king is not responding. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered him out of the mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard. And I smote him and I slew him. I don't care what you see, O king. I don't care what you believe, O king. This is what I did. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine for the third time shall be as one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Look at verse 37. And this is, if you are highlighting or circling verses, this is one to do. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion. The, notice the word is past tense. There are many of us in this room today. We've had times when the Lord has delivered us. It doesn't matter how big the deliverance was or how small the deliverance was. It was a deliverance because we knew we couldn't do it. And David says, the Lord that delivered me past tense. He remembered the God who delivered. And see, we forget that sometimes. Because especially if the deliverance was a small thing, we forget that it was still God who did the delivering. I think there's a verse somewhere, and if you all know where it is, just shout it out. When God comes to, and I can't remember who, maybe it was Isaiah, and he says, Isaiah, remind me of the the conversations that we had. Remind me of our relationship. And see, we forget too quickly that God delivered us before. And David says, the God who delivered me out of the hand, the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this uncircumcised Philistine. 
David let his past experience with God determine how he's going to view his future experience with God. And see, so for, so for, so for many of us, our past experience of, with God is here, and there's a lot of junk here in between that has kind of drowned out what God has done for us in the past, that we don't see that the same God who delivered us before all this junk can deliver us again. But see, David knew something that Israel did not, David understood something that Israel did not understand. See, David understood, and we're going to read it, that the battle is not with flesh and blood. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Does that ring a bell? We, for we rest not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and wickedness on high. Okay? David understood that. David said, more of the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, go, because I'm afraid to, and let the Lord be with you. <laughs> and, 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 Saul said, and Saul told David, you go because I'm a chicken, and may the Lord be with you. I don't think he will. Think about it. That's what he's telling him. You go, and the Lord be with you. And David armed, and Saul armed David with his armor, and he put it on his helmet of brass upon his head. He also armed him with the coat of mail. <laughs> David's now going to go postal. <laughs> 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 and David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, but he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off. Verse 40, and he took his staff in his hand, chose him five smooth stones out of the brook, and put them in his shepherd's bag, which he had even in a script, and his sling was upon his hand. And the Philistines came, came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistines looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was a youth and ruddy and a fair countenance. In other words, he was not a man of war. And the Philistines said unto David, Am I a dog that you come after me with staves? And, and the Philistines cursed David. I mean, cursed him. You know? See, the sailors learned this from Goliath. Okay? Cursing like a sailor? Okay. They, Thank you. I'm glad someone caught that. <laughs> They learned that from Goliath, okay? <laughs> and the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and the beasts of the field. And I can just see King Saul. See, I told you. <laughs> I told you. See, this is what's going to happen. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. That's who I come in the name of. The sad thing about the body of Christ today is that we have joined the enemy of the soul and defying the name of the Lord, and defying the name of his people. We have joined them. And, and until that changes, what we're seeing happen today is going to continue, probably on a faster pace than it could. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This Now, see, we read this and we see David talking to Goliath, don't we? But do you realize, ladies and gentlemen, that the armies of Israel had also defied God because they were not living in the covenant that God had established with them? So David was also pointing a finger 
at the armies of Israel. He was, that's what he was doing. And see, we live in such a culture today that if we begin pointing fingers at people who should know better, we get criticized, we get ostracized, we get marginalized. Because you shouldn't be pointing things out like that. When you look in Scripture, disobedience to the Lord, rebellion to God was always called to someone's attention. Take a look at Scripture and tell me I'm wrong. So go see, God, <laughs> I'm going to say it anyway, Stephen. God doesn't like ugly. <laughs> I mean, there's no scriptural basis for that. But God doesn't like ugly. And ugly is anything that goes against his word. He doesn't like that. And he's going to let you know he does not like that. And so for those of us in the body of Christ who refuse to text, to talk about people who are doing things like that, we're defying the God we serve. And just like in Numbers chapter 12, verse 2, God hears it. And just like in Numbers chapter 12, you're going to hear about it yourself on the day of judgment. It's not going to cost you your salvation. But God is going to let you know that you didn't stand for me like you should have as my son or my daughter. You're coming in. But let me let me show you what you gave up by not standing for me. Curtain number one. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. This day, verse 30, 46, will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand? Who's going to do the delivering? The Lord. It's going to deliver you in my hand and I will smite thee. He's going to deliver you. Now listen to this. God's going to put you in the position of being victorious, but then you have to do your part. So God's going to deliver you to my hands, Goliath, and when he does, I'm going to cut off your head. I will smite thee and take thine head from, that, from thee, and I will give the, carcass of, of the, give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, and that all the earth may know. That there is a God in Israel. How are they going to know that there is a God in Israel? Because David is going to cut off the head of Goliath. You're going to like this one. Before you can say that there is a God in America... You first have to know and believe that God is in you. Before you can say that there is a God in America, you first have to know and believe that God is in you. David knew this by covenant. We should know this by sonship. Notice I said should. We should know this by sonship. Remember Jesus said, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. That's why I can do the works of my Father because he is in me. Too many of us don't understand God is in us. Three more verses. The last part of verse 46 again. That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly, all this assembly, all you soldiers of Israel and the Philistines, all this assembly will know that the Lord saveth not by what? The sword. Ladies and gentlemen, if you, if you don't remember anything else, remember that the Lord does not save by what happens in the natural. The battle is spiritual. The Lord saveth not by the sword and the spear, for the battle is the Lord, and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass when the Philistines arose and came and drew nigh to David, 
to meet David. Well, I want to see. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Okay, that took care of verse 47. About the two major truths that the Lord said was not by the sword and spear, but the battle belongs to him. Okay, getting down to verse 48. And it came to pass when the Philistines arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran away from the army. David hasted and ran toward the army. That word hasted, it means to be liquid or flow easily. Think about what I'm saying. To be liquid or flow easily. What flows easily in our lives when our heart beats with our Father? The anointing. Which flows easily. To hurry, to go swiftly, to charge like a lion. So many of us, when we are faced with a difficult situation, we hesitate, we take a step back, we do an evaluation as we're taking steps back, and how we're we going to deal with this situation. David said, heck with that. <laughs> the Lord has already delivered you into my hands. So he runs toward the problem. When's the last time you ran toward the problem? And you know it's, it's a figurative running. But you, don't, you, you run toward the problem by doing the things that you know to do. You speak the word. You worship. You pray in tongues. Fast. You do those things. That's how you, us, the body of Christ, run toward that problem. That's what we do. We don't back down. David ran, and I can just see Goliath looking at this. Wait a minute. Hold up. He's running toward me. Is he crazy? <laughs> He's running toward me. And David is running and thinking, Cut out the lies, the party's over. That's what he's doing. Your, the party is over, Goliath. It's done. Cut out the lights. And David, verse 4, now put his hand in his bag, took thence the stone, and slang it, and smote the Philistine in his forehead. Now, one thing I want you to understand. All shepherds knew how to use a sling. Okay? So David wasn't just fumbling around and, you know, trying to get it to fit right and dropping it and had to pick it back up as he's running and tripping over his feet. No, he has used this before. He knows how to use a sling. Because the Bible said that there are certain men in Bethlehem who could use a sling and knock off the gnat out of a bull's eye or something like that. You know, he could, he, they were so good they could hit a fly with a gnat, with that, with that sling. It would not surprise me one bit if that was not David. And slang it and smote the Philistine in the forehead, and the stone sank into his forehead. And he f can you see how God worked in this? Because didn't he have a big old helmet over his head? So David said, God will deliver you into my hand. So God found the space, the place where that stone needed to go. And he fell upon the, his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in David's hand. Therefore, David, verse 51, I lied to you. I said verse 50 verses. We're going to go one more. Forgive me, Lord, for I have sinned. <laughs> Therefore, David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword, drew it out of the sheath, thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. They fled. David took Goliath's sword, removed his head, which was an act of humiliation. Okay? And see, ladies and gentlemen, every battle that we have with the enemy of the soul should end with his humiliation. Every battle single battle, bar none. We should be victorious in every single battle. What we see in this passage for us today, in the natural, your battles are always going to be larger than you. 
They're always going to be larger than you. But you have to remember from what place you fight your battles. You will have to decide whose servant you are. And see, Israel decided to be Saul's servants when they say we want a king, a man of flesh and blood to rule over us and not God Almighty. So they made the decision to be a servant of someone lesser than God. You have to decide whose servant you are going to be. In every battle, there will be an opportunity for you to fear. But the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, I believe, that there is no fear in love. The more you love, the less you fear. And see, the more you love is saying the more that I love God, the more that I trust God, and the more that I know God, which means I'm going to fear less and less because I know who my father is. You don't speak unbelief, words without life and deliverance in your battles. How many of us have prolonged our battles because of what we said? Or prolonged our battles because of what we thought? And see, you may think that, well, I can have those thoughts, but if I don't speak them, it's okay. No, it's not. You have to get your mind renewed that only one thing matters, speaking life into every situation. And then the last one. When the battle starts, you run toward it. Declare that, you, that when you're done, the word is going to spread that there is a God where you live. The people are going to look at you and they're going to say, there is a God. I, I know because I knew what was going on with him. I knew what was going on with her and it's not happening anymore. It's different. They're going to know that there was a God. Amen. I like looking at records like that in the Old Testament. And it's always the same in a way. I look at them, I'm reading them because I'm just enjoying the records, the passages. Because there are certain things you pick up just by reading them. But then when the Lord decides that he's going to show you, Barry, I know you enjoy reading this, but let me show you what it looks like today in the, in the body of Christ, what it looks like for Christians. Yeah, that's fun. And Every time he does that, Barry gets a spanking every single time because I see that there are areas in my life that I need to work on, like we all do. But that's okay. Our father loves us. And if he did not discipline us, he would not love us. As you go forth today, ladies and gentlemen, go forth knowing that it does not matter what you see with your eyes, with your physical eyes. It does not matter what you hear with your physical ears. That is not where the battle is. The battle is spiritual. Because first of all, you are a spirit being. And that is where your strength is. Because you now have the life and nature of your father working on the inside of you. You need to take that life and nature that's already in you and use it so that people will know that there is a God where you live. Amen? Please stand. We are such a blessed people when we allow ourselves to be blessed. We are such a delivered people when we allow ourselves to be delivered. The biggest thing that keeps us from living like who we are is not believing who we are. And I know you, you're probably thinking, Brother Barry, the messages that you delivered all kind of center on us, the choices we make, the decisions we make. That's the way it works. That's the way it works. See, you decide how much of God you want. God does not make that decision for you. 
you have to decide. You decide how much of your life you're going to expose to the enemy of the soul. You decide that. He doesn't decide that. Matter of fact, he doesn't decide anything in your life. Neither does your heavenly father. Not until you give him your life that he can use and make decisions. So I encourage you, ladies and gentlemen, think about what we have read here this morning in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And just see the picture that God is painting for us. That even though Goliath in the natural was, unde was unbeatable, a little shepherd who knew he had a covenant with God took him down with a pebble, with a stone, and then used his own sword to cut off his head. And that's how we should be. Let's humiliate our enemy by cutting off his head in every situation we find ourselves in. Amen. Heavenly Father, you are a God of great mercy. And you are God that's long-suffering. And Father, I just thank you that you have a group of people here this morning that you don't have to do a lot of long-suffering over. Because we're all ready, ready to stand with you and to be the people who will show our communities that there is a God in heaven. Not a Muslim God, not any other kind of God, only the God in heaven. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we have to be your sons and daughters. And we thank you, Lord, that you have put your faith, your confidence in us. And that we're going to stand for the body of Christ. And that we're going to go into the world, Lord. And where we find a reproach against the body of Christ, we're not going to let that reproach stand. We're not going to let it stand. We're not out to win friends. We're not out to make people happy. We are out to change lives. So let our lives be a reflection of what you desire in this world, Lord. We give you praise and we give you glory. And we thank you for giving us your son who paved the way that we can have life everlasting. We thank you for this day, Lord. And we thank you for an afternoon of rest and relaxation or whatever we may do. And we just look forward to what you're going to do tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have a gift or an offering, please bring it up. And for those of you who are watching, there's PayPal. You can send or gift donation via PayPal. Or you can just write us a note. The address is on the, on the website and send your donation that way. God loves you. And you are the apple of his eye. Have a great day today.